<clears throat> You've seen many talks today where our presenters have discussed concepts and projects they are thinking about. This group, our audience here today, is the future of technology. You are the people who are thinking about the next big thing and considering the future of hardware and all of your designs. We invited Sid Mead to join us because he is one of the original futurists. One of his earliest projects is the concept art for Star Trek in 1978. Sid is a visual futurist who is well known for some of the most visually interesting works in the history of film. He designed the science fiction films Blade Runner, Aliens, and Tron. I was introduced to Sid work, Sid's work when I first saw Tron, and he's been an influence ever since. He designs for science fiction because he feels science fiction is nothing but reality of head of schedule. His incredible artwork has been used in films, costumes, and video games since the early 70s. We are honored today to introduce Sid Mead to the Hackaday Supercon. Ladies and gentlemen, Sid Mead. <laughs> This is so cool, I can hardly believe it. When I, was, when I was younger, about your age, I guess, somebody who was older than I was told me, always try to hang around with people smarter than you are. So, you know, here I am. And obviously younger, moving around. Uh, the whole thing about future is fascinating because we don't know exactly what's going to happen. Now, we have 15-year 15 15 mortgages and you pay off your car in five or whatever it happens to be. But the future, we really don't know. The, the whole deal, there we go, okay. The whole deal about the future is that the guesswork the technical expertise that makes it happen depends on the people that are working on the projects, their grasp of what they don't know and want to find out. So to me, the future is a guessing game that is elaborately expected. So the future is now, because five minutes from now is the future, one second from now is the future, and the whole thing rattles along at its own speed. Some, there is a couple versions of the future. Some people think, well, it's already happened. We're just arriving minute by minute at where it already is. The future is now. And I, what I'm fascinated with is that being an expert, Mark Twain said, an expert is anybody from out of town with an accent. The, <laughs> so here are some examples. Now, these, are, these should be embarrassing to these people. Some of them are dead. But here's one. Man will never reach the moon regardless of all future scientific advances. This was uh, Lee DeForest, the father of radio and grandfather of television. Thank you very much. <laughs> Computers in the future may weigh no more than one and a half tons. <laughs> and you'd have to use Fortran to use them. Another one. I think there is a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM. This is 1943, so give him 60 years of, of slack. Another one is, <laughs> but what is it good for? Engineer at the Advanced, Advanced Computing Systems Division of IBM, 1968, more recent, should have known, about it, known better. I think Bill took the program and the microchip. Here was another one. There is no reason anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, president, chairman, and founder of Digital Equipment Corporation. Another one, the supercomputer is technologically impossible. It would take all of the water that flows over Niagara Falls to cool the vacuum tubes. <laughs> and here's my favorite. 640K ought to be enough for anybody. <laughs> Bill Gates. Thank you, Bill. So as we go on, and you guys, as he just, as Mike just mentioned, are the future of investigation, of thought about why things are the way they are, and how they're going to change. There's, there's one 
Well, we're going to do a, a SID quickie, first of all, so you think, you know, what is my, my background? I was in Detroit. God, I was young. Worked for Ford. This is one of the renderings I did for Ford. Uh, they didn't hire me to work on production. They hired me to work on concept designs for show cars. So this was one, and I like this because what you do is you think of the ultimate solution and then you backtrack until it fits current technology. So here we have this bubble. The reason I used to put people in long robes, robes I didn't have to draw feet. They're very difficult. <laughs> so this is my work at Ford. This was my total contribution to American automobilia. The tail light bezel on the 1964 Falcon Futura. Isn't that wondrous? Wow. So I was working for a light truck, Ford light truck. This is after I quit. And uh, they said, we want a futuristic light pickup truck for the light truck division. This was my presentation rendering, and they said it looked too GM. So, <laughs> so this is, I fortified it, and this is how it came out as a running steel body uh, prototype. And this is moi parked, sat and sitting in the driver's seat. Now look at this cabin right here. This moved back. And, oh, there's the young lady on the, we're going to have to move her back along with it. So that moved back. And then this middle section came up, which meant that you now had a club sedan with a little bit of pickup space left in the back. This was built back in about 1964 on a Ford station wagon chassis. I think it still looks good. So I was very fortunate. Um, <laughs> I quit Ford, was paid $10,000 to do the first steel book in one month, 30 days, had enough to buy this car for $5,000 cash at the time. Now they're a million dollar car. Had it for 43 years, three paint jobs, chrome plating, new glass, new rubber, but it was an absolute joy. Bought, bought my first house. I was all by myself, single, a 10 bedroom, six bathroom house. Of course, that's what you, you know, need to run around in. So spent the next nine and a half, year, nine and a half years fixing it up, furnishing, and then uh, sold it. Now, there's three phrases which I mentioned. You can download these over any era in human history and with the subsets, you can describe everything that's been going on. They are where we live, where we go, and how we get there. So think about that overlay map onto uh, human society. So where we live. The, where we live is home. There's a fashion now of doing these real, really cathartic, everything's turning to shit movies. Well, thank you, Roland Emmerich. And so, so I think maybe it's a catharsis because you think, well, it hasn't happened to me yet. So to give you an example of the world's population distribution where everybody lives, these two elements right here, India, up into China, China, there they are. And here's the astonishing graphic. There are as many people inside the circle than there are in the rest of the world. This is an aerial view of Mumbai and hot property. There's your route to the supermarket right there. So this is what happens when you have to put a lot of people in a relatively confined space on the Earth's surface. Now, why this is true, I have no idea. I was looking at this when I first downloaded it and said, what? What does this guy think he's doing? He's climbed the ladder. He's on this pier that supports the girder, which supports the rail, which, which supports the train. And I don't know where he's going to go from there. I have no idea. And I don't know how they do let sandwich service up here either. I have no idea. There's a view property. This is Mexico City. Another place where you've just got to pack a lot of people in a limited space. The future of cities has been illustrated a lot. 
They're social organizations. They're the people uh, live in cities because of the uh, collection of talent, the interaction with other people. Over half the world's population now lives in cities. So you can, you can do an idealized view of a city, of the future. Buildings that rise aren't too, too many of them. Maybe this is the drone, maximum drone, drone height. Freeway traffic going through the city. On the next example, this was done for the new Yamato. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that anime series. I redesigned the Yamato and did a lot of the design work for the uh, episodes. But the, the view of this city was done because after they've defeated the bad guys, there's always bad guys, they build this city and it's pleasant and there's little families having picnics on the lawn here, and floating around. And it's idyllic. And at least it's something we enjoy looking at and maybe if we do this enough, the world will actually turn out that way. This is highly idealized, a quick sketch for a customer that wanted a cityscape for an advertisement. This was done for Automobile Quarterly way back in the early, well, middle 60s. And the idea was that we have anti-gravity, which we do, nobody knows that. These are single, single person little uh, vehicles. And these people are waiting in line to board this huge, huge mobile parking lot. Now off in the distance, you can see this one, which is already up to this enormous building. I mean, it has to, has to weigh more than half Chicago. So it was an idea of idealistically pretending that the world could get to this point. This was done for a company in South Africa, uh, Avrox, and they said, here's what we want you to do, Mead. We want you to come, with, come up with three engineering projects which look like they'd be completely impossible. So I said, sure, I can do that. So this is a hexagonal beam of enormous dimensions. It starts, it's resting on the harbor, bar, 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 bottom right here, goes all the way up to the mountain, top of it. The These guys are supervisors. This, you can see the welding marks going on here. This is a feature restaurant. So the whole thing is, is literally massively impossible. Who knows? Who knows? I think probably the worst thing you can say about the future is that this is never going to happen. Be cautious. You know, your age is, you're looking ahead. Don't say that in, in 60 years we can't make new bodies and move in. I think we will. This was a view of Pittsburgh. There's the Amangahela on the right. And uh, it was done for Alcoa to feature and celebrate the idea of aluminum being light enough to build cliff high, cliffside houses on steep cliffs with the vertical funiculars to get people up and down. So we get to the interior of the house of the future. Purely romantic. There's a father and son watching a 3D projection on this screen. I made it transparent so you can see through it. You can see the kids out there on the terrace playing with their robot dog. And I do expect that we will, not too far in the future, there'll be apartments and condos which will have signs reading, only robot pets allowed. This was done for a company, BAC. Do you know what that stands for? British American Tobacco. <clears throat> so they said, what's the next thing? Uh, people aren't going to smoke anymore. We're bad guys. We're making cigarettes and condemning people to a lifetime of cancer disease. So let's come up with something that could be the next step. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I said, sure, we can do that. Now this lady, she has one of these one of these party globes here, and she's inhaling I don't know almond or persimmon or or menthol. Uh, maybe it has a uh, tobacco nicotine content. Maybe not. But the idea was to have a social uh, procedure that sort of takes the place of lighting up and having a cigarette lighter and all the paraphernalia that make smoking is largely a performance. So we have houses, we have row houses, we have houses that all look alike. The original Levittown was the master plan 
for the American uh, machine-made suburb. Sometimes people like a more distinctive house. This is an example of English, elaborate English half framing. And then if you really want to amaze your friends, do the inside of the lobby like this. They'll never forget being there. So when things go bad, you have to move. Uh, can you go home again? Sometimes not. If any of you have visited your real early childhood residences and realized how tiny they were, and now you're grown up and you're six foot, six foot plus, and you think, how did we ever get up and down the stairs? How did mom and dad get the bed up there, for Christ's sakes? Huge. So some people like to linger on. Uh, Grandma still lives here, uh, but you know she'll be gone soon. Then we can tear the thing down. So we've talked about where we live, and the next major imprint phrase is where do we go? Where do we go? What are the destinations when we leave home? I love that hat. I've got to have a hat like that. You've got to tell me where you got it. I mean, bling is my soul. And, and thinking about bling, this used to be a Maserati dealership. Did you know that? Uh, not enough people knew what a quatrefort was, so they had to close it up. So where we go from home, maybe we go out in the mountains with our buddies and girlfriends and our, our expandable uh, vehicle that lays its, its uh, tires down for civility and a pleasant mountain afternoon spent with friends. Or we go to a, visit a castle in Europe. Uh, my, my partner Roger and I visited the uh, famous castle by, by Mad King Ludwig, biggest ripoff in Europe if you are unfortunate enough to get tied up in it. Or maybe you go to a luxury hotel. This was a job that I was given to for an architect uh, group in Houston, I believe. And they had an old hotel in Savannah that they wanted to completely reverbage. Somebody had you know, paid a lot of money. All of this ornolu and statuary and stuff was buried in, was in the basement in storage. So they sent me pictures of all this. This is a painting. It took me about a week and a half. And it's, it's unbelievably detailed. And we have people, we have paintings in the background. They sent me the flower arrangements. So it was all done about a, about a week and a half. The floral pattern on the chair, side chair. So everything was painted with a brush in gouache. I call gouache French for bitchy medium. <laughs> and uh, I put paint on cardboard with animal hairs on the end of a stick. Old school for sure. Now I know guys who do ex exquisite electronic painting. Uh, a friend of ours in London, he's just working out here in Hollywood now. Uh, but it's, it's, first you have to know how to make a picture. If you don't know how to do that, I don't care how much you spend. My favorite is if you have a million dollar computer and a dumb idea, guess what you end up with? A million dollar dumb idea. So maybe you visit the city, go into the city or another city. This is done for General Electric Plastics Automotive Division. This was done for Japan Rail East, a um, big, big part of the Japanese railroad system uh, up and down the east coast of, of the three Japanese islands. I don't know if it goes over to Shikoku or not, but this was part of a rendering to dramatize looking up through an air slot in the train station to architecture uh, blocks and blocks and blocks away. This was done also for Japan Rail East, and it was an idea for a complex. This was the uh, conference hall right here. This was an IMAX theater, skating rink, hotel, condo, and hotels around here. And the idea was to make it sort of look like a shogun's castle. They liked it very much, and it was never built. A lot of things are like that. I've worked on a lot of movies in pre-production. And they're, they're never done. I just say, well, they're, they end up hanging from one of the dead branches of the Hollywood dream tree. <laughs> I did design two restaurants in New York in a new building. The architects were fans of mine, which helps a lot. 
because we could do uh, embedments in the concrete as the building was being built. So I'm standing in front of what was going to be the entrance to Bar Basque. They were going to fly over, and they did, to, for opening. They flew over Basque chefs from Spain to introduce different uh, authentic uh, area dishes, cuisine, and a selection of Basque wines. Now these tubes were chrome. I, what I envisioned was as cars drive by, and especially at night, you get a continuous motion up and down the length of these tubes. These holes were for lights, which would blink randomly. And of course, they put the sign right over them. Thank you. <laughs> this was the inside of the food park. This is a rendering looking out towards the plaza, which was beyond the big glass doors opposite the entrance on 6th Avenue, Avenue of the Americas. And here were the graphics, food park. Uh, I like this very much, actually. They never used it. They used sort of a cartoon, um, kind of an ugly cartoon typeface. I have no idea why. And this was the finished installation. Now, it was bisque white, very soft white finish. And I had uh, used these mirror inserts. See one here, down here. To sort of bring the outside motion and sky color. Outside is very blue compared to incandescent lighting inside a building. So this is the finished installation. And another interesting thing was, here's for the fire department, right here. I thought, God, that's ugly. And it's bright, screaming red in an all-white environment. So I tried to make it into a piece of art with you know, gradually redder and redder and redder bands coming down to the oblong and all. Fire commissioner comes in and says, no, you can't do that. These firemen will come in here, they won't know what, where, where the fire alarm is. And I thought, Jesus, who do they hire? <laughs> this is a view out towards Sixth Avenue. Uh, again, the, the space is finished. And these uh, different floor textures were shiny, not shiny, shiny, to give an illusion of walking across uh, water. This was a lighting test. The light uh, mass could be changed, slowed down, sped up. This was just to test the feasibility of the uh, computer-driven uh, light mountings. So we had the bar basket on the, the top. Uh, had to go back. Can't go back. Uh, you know, here we go. This was a uh, SketchUp model showing the progression of steps from the very white, sort of clean uh, color scheme of the food park, going up the steps, gradually getting darker and darker and darker to the black and red color scheme, which was the upstairs of the bar basque. This is how it looked all finished, looking back towards the stairs. People love to sit here. You could look out and see the trees. There was a plaza out and back, have their lunch, and uh, it worked out really very well, aesthetically. This is my partner, Roger, standing in front talking to a lady at the, uh, at the bar downstairs in Food Park. These were glass layers, leaves. It took me about an afternoon to come up with this, with very rapidly drawing lines, overlapping leaf patterns and then isolating them in Illustrator and sending them off to the glass factory. So now we're upstairs. Uh, Bar Basque was uh, Basque, Spanish, very masculine. So I thought, let's do it in red, very bright red, and black and chrome. The nice thing about red, <coughs> excuse me, is that as the lighting level gets down, it's still red. It doesn't change color. It still keeps its vibrant impact on your, on your retina. So this was the upstairs lounge looking toward the bar. And I made very particular care on the alignment of a diagonal in a section uh, thing. There was also diagonals on the ceiling. So my idea was, the concept, was that uh, I had designed this restaurant a long time ago. On a, on a plan, 
And then the building interrupted the plan and sort of skewed it. That was the concept. They never got it, but then, you know, you have to have fun with these things. This was the bar. Each of these leaves, well, this was supposed to sort of link concept-wise with the food park at uh, ground level. Each of those leaves was individually drawn in an illustrator and put into place for the eventual fabrication. So maybe, instead of going to the, to the bar, to the restaurant, maybe we go watch the races. This was done for the first and last Tokyo International Sports Fair. And they wanted a, three posters uh, colorized sort of monochromatically on the three prizes, first, second, and third. So I had the other two done, blue and red ones, and I thought, God, what am I going to do for number three? I was coming back from Houston on Continental, reading the uh, Air, In Air magazine, and they had an article on dog racing in Miami, Greyhounds. And I looked at this rendering of this photograph, and I said, that's it. So I take the thing home, this is long before scanners and computers, and had the, the uh, photograph people photograph it. I went down, picked it up, brought it back, traced over it, took out one of the dogs, or two of the dogs, and left these six in because they had a dynamic kind of a, a pose. And then roboticized them, or mechanized them. So the pose and the, the kinetics and everything are very, very accurate. This is one of the more um, famous, if you can call it that, high visibility images I've ever done. Maybe we take the kids to the fusion plant. This was, <laughs> this was done for a client in the uh, energy industry. Now this is all done by hand. Now with computers, you'd make one pass and then you go da 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 and map this onto a curved surface. No, 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 no. When you do it by hand, you have to be very careful to make the ellipses disappear as they go around the curve. It's a test of patience, and you can't party too hard the night before. <laughs> or maybe we'll go to take a trip to the moon to visit one of the manufacturing facilities. When I first moved out here to Southern California, uh, sometimes the moon is still up when the sky is blue. <coughs> Excuse me. And the blue is the darkest color in the, in the uh, uh, illusion. So I started there and did this rendering of the moon, about four, four uh, shades of gray on blue. So it has that sort of ethereal look to it. Uh, yeah, I know it's hollow. There's a whole theory about that. <laughs> so you'd stay at one of the, this is the moon city. <laughs> this, this was done for a couple of guys who, we had lunch with them out at the Century Plaza in Beverly Hills, which is fantasy land anyway. And uh, during lunch, the guy pauses and he said, uh, he said, I have to call Paris Hilton, excuse me. I went, oh, Jesus, talk about dredging up. So this was uh, done for this movie that was gonna be made about a teenage crew, sort of like Boy Scouts on the Moon, uh, one kid, his father, was um, the marshal for the whole moon base and found out these evil people were trying to blow it up. So this was going to be a three-scale model of San Francisco. You can see the park and the bridge. And these were the suburbs right here. And here's your ship arriving at the pad. So it was, it was fun to do. Or maybe we'll visit an asteroid mining operation shown here. Ships are taking on loads to go back to Earth. Sort of the, the way far in the future fantasy is that all the manufacturing and the bad stuff would be done off planet and brought back for our, our enjoyment or convenience. Uh, it takes 15 minutes the speed of light to get to Mars. We can get there in 20. And the reason is that Tesla said Einstein was wrong. Maybe we go to a world rotating in space. That's in the far future. And then how we get there. So we've done where we live, where we go. We got to get from A to B, started off walking, started off uh, riding on trained, relatively trained animals, 
switch to animals pulling a cart or something for us to ride in. So things got easier and easier and easier and easier and faster as far as that goes. So let's pursue sort of the history of there was this guy in France in the late 17th century, Robida. Now, these are fantastic conveyances. What, what it points up is the fact that you can't think about something you can't think about. We're limited up in here. When we have computers that go faster uh, than the human brain, uh, neural networks and so forth, uh, particularly the quantum, we're going to have help. We're going to be able to conceive sort of a notion and have the computer go through many, many iterations, present them to us, and we'll pick the best one. I know that's going to happen. Not, not, I'm not predicting when, OK? Uh, so we started <laughs> with horse-drawn carriages. This is the doctor's bu uh, buggy. Can you imagine making house calls in this in November in Alaska? So then we thought, well, maybe if we enclosed it, it would be a little more comfortable. There's no air conditioning or, or heat, but at least you're inside out of the weather. The driver has to sit up here, but screw him, that's his job. <laughs> then, now, here's... What would you do with a trend to really ruin it is to run it out to ad absurdum. This is the ad, abs ad absurdum, absurdum of the coach industry, the horse-drawn coach. Now here's Prince Philip uh, and Queen Elizabeth riding in this thing, and they're probably thinking, Jesus Christ, this is ridiculous. This, is the, this has to be the dumbest thing in the, in the palace garage. But there you have it. <laughs> So then the next phase was, I know, let's do something like a bicycle or something to move faster. This was the first bicycle. You sat on this saddle up here, and you put your feet on the ground, and you push yourself along, and then coast and push some more. But so it was faster than walking. Then we went to motorcycles, motorbikes. This is maximum packing on a motor motorbike. Jesus. Then we had self-powered vehicles. Now we're starting to win the game. This was the first steam dray, 1769. Things got a little bit more streamlined. The, the locomotive came in steam-driven. Uh, grand vitesse in French means very fast. Well, <laughs> sort of laughable, but at the time, you know. This charms me, this picture of these two little boys looking at this huge, huge piece of machinery. I mean, it just weighs hundreds of tons. But what it demonstrates is the, la the next time you're standing at the base of a 100-story building, just hold up your hands and think head. And we did this with our hands, our brains. We make machines that make machines that make machines. And we furnish our world with the results of intelligence, putting our opposable thumb hands together with our brain and invent this stuff to make these things. I think that's astonishing. So then we thought, well, let's make these things a little bit prettier. This was Cadillac Divisions 1906, first enclosed car. Isn't that fantastic? Not very aerodynamic, but then you're only going 20 miles an hour. And then we had, we were reluctant to let go of the coach idea. I think this is hysterical the way, to make three coach bodies all jammed together on a motor-driven vehicle. I think I love it. And some astonishing cars were fabricated back in the 40s and 50s out of relatively, uh, well, today compared to today, relatively primitive mechanical uh, capabilities. But beautiful. I think this is the most beautiful roadster ever made back in the 30s. So automobiles became uh, a, a test of expertise in thinking about mobility, thinking about speed, thinking about uh, the engine uh, component, and then thinking about ergonomics and doing these digital studies 
of containing the package with three, four people, whatever it happens to be. Uh, Toyota hired me. Whoops, I have to go back. I think. This is now Mike. Wait a minute. Jotamante could have said. Well. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. There we go. That's that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> All these newfangled things. God. So Toyota, uh, my partner Roger and I went out to this, you know, secret warehouse in Westminster or somewhere in God forsaken West, and uh, we're let in and allowed to take pictures of this car. Well, you know, it didn't look any different than last year's Toyota, but uh, I said, okay, so this is, this is not stretched. This is an actual, very accurate trace over a photograph of that car at that time uh, because of the lens, slight lens distortion, and the background is pure fantasy to make you think that, oh my God, this is what we're all gonna be driving in the future. I didn't last long, one model year. And the Cadillac, beautiful car. And you think, really? Some, I said to somebody, what in the hell happened? And they said, well, it attracts attention. And I said, so does the two-headed calf at the county fair. <laughs> Another one. So years and years ago, uh, Ken Purdy, who was the editor of Modern Living for Playboy. Yes, I was in Playboy, not as a centerfold. <laughs> so we were doing a series of tiny, tiny uh, mini cars for city, city use, and this was one of my designs for that article. I don't know why he's wearing a vest. <laughs> so I had a, a seven year, or a 10 year contract, 12 year, what am I saying, with the Philips Electronics in Eindhoven, Holland. And I worked with their NAT lab, which I think is Nederland's advanced technology. And I was hired to say, or talk to the NAT lab people, and they'd say, look, we're gonna be able to have skin switches instead of mechanical linkages and all that stuff. So, and we can mold batteries any shape we want. So I would work on designs of products that were maybe five, six years ahead of the production cycle. Uh, at the time, designers in Europe went through a restrictive training that said, you can't design it until it's been engineered. Now it's changed, but back then, some of these guys had absolutely inability to absorb what I was doing. They couldn't understand it. They wouldn't even talk to me. So this little car, there was a very wealthy family in Holland called the Schimmelpenix Tobacco. And their son, one of their sons, had come up with this uh, Vit car, which is a white car in Dutch. And it was really ugly. So Knut Iran, the head of uh, Philips Design at the time, <coughs> said, uh, Sid, come up with something that's, you know, a little city car. So this was it. Uh, this canopy lifts up. This module is replaceable. And these things here, it's a, it's a drop bar that runs up over a pyramid to charge the car. It's electric. And because it's paid for, you put your credit card right in here, and uh, you pay for your ride. Time duration, just like Lyft or Uber. There was a guy in, in Japan, in Osaka, who was an entrepreneur, had a big, big company, very, very wealthy, and he was gonna redo, when they had the big earthquake in Kobe, Osaka area, a lot of the piers, the shipping piers, were deep water, and the sand, shifted and filled them in. So he had taken over one of these piers and I designed a theme park for this pier and one of his ideas was to have little cars that could be rented or leased for short duration or whatever for this project that go across the bridge into the project, drive around and so forth. So this was one of the, one of the designs. If you want to make your smart car shorter,
There have been people, now thinking about the future, the reason I put this picture in is because somebody built this as a car of the future on pure, pure whimsy. I think it's fantastic. It just says, this is not today. Completely impracticable, impracticable, that's wonderful. Then the auto companies, this was the Lincoln Futura, which became sort of the Lincoln Premier in production. And this famous Firebird, designed by Norm James, at General Motors, purely conceptual. You really couldn't have a car like this in the parking lot, could you? Now, when I was at Ford, uh, I was in, the, in the, the advanced studio. We were doing show cars. So we had this idea, excuse me, got that taco, um, of doing a gyro-balanced car, tandem wheels. And so I came up with this design, and it had the skeg fin here. It was supposed to make it look more like it was floating over the ground. Uh, big, big glass canopy, which was very fashionable then. And uh, so the people in Chicago, I think their uh, Honeywell Corporation, said, uh, we have a gyro to keep this two-ton buck, whatever it is, uh, vertical for a week once it's spun up because it was a gyro that stabilized destroyer gun turrets. And the executives in the studio thought, ah, it's going to be so embarrassing if this falls over. Oh, for Christ's sakes, they just told you it would hold up for a week. So the one that they built was a, an idea from Elwood Engel, who was studio head, one of his naive designs from his Pratt graduation portfolio. But I rendered it very expertly. Sometimes you have to do a dumb idea just to be paid, okay? <laughs> the uh, 2000, uh, that will be, how am I doing on time? Okay, the, the Pebble Beach Con Concourse d'Elegance in the year 2000, I did a triptych. This is the far left panel. We have the Hypervan, which is my, my favorite vehicle because I designed it. Uh, we have my 94 Cadillac Fleetwood, which at the time I thought, this is going to be a classic, and a Bugatti. And people standing around this group on the far right, are some of them are robots, some of them are, uh, are humans. <laughs> Now this vehicle has a carbon footprint of about six Humvees, but God, <laughs> God, I just love it, these big wheels. Um, four people. This is done and posed in front of my friend's house in Palm Springs, and I took a picture of the mountains. If you go that one spot, the mountains match exactly. Time Life Books. God, this is a long time ago. They were gonna do an article on the future of transportation. I thought, well, sure, we're going to have aerial cars. Why not? So here's a family, and their, the car is only about you know nine feet wide, but they're taking off through this gate, and the, the triangular pad back there checks the condition of your car to see if you're safe to use the airways. Let's hope that remains the case when we actually have flying cars. So they're taking off on the vacation or whatever. So this is a view. I did all my own separations. This was a fantasy job. I thought, <clears throat> here's a, a capsule attached to two drive mo modules that become the landing gear when you come in for a landing. And this girl back there has her own uh, mascot, driver, bodyguard. He's a robot. The family crest is on the shield right here. And she's dressed, well, almost dressed and this diaphanous coating of sparkling crystals. The, the whole idea of transport fascinates me. And I thought, let's, let's again do a gyroscopically balanced tandem wheel vehicle called a mobilage. The mobilage, that sounds softer, sort of a Frenchified version of the word. So here we're at a house, private house, party going on. And these mobilage are, are pulling up. 
where you'd be parked by robot valets that look like people. And Blade Runner. I was very, very fortunate. Blade Runner was the first movie I worked on from pre-production to post-production. And I was hired to design just the vehicles, but I painted my way into the whole picture by showing the vehicles in situ, in the environment of this, this dreary, sort of dystopian world uh, ambiance. Here's an alien vehicle going by very fast. And a big space liner. Uh, sailing craft. Three quarters of the Earth's surface is covered in water. So I've done a couple of design jobs. This was done for a fellow in Miami for a custom sloop. Very proud of this. This was done for a Middle Eastern sheikh. And uh, here they, here we go. Whoops, come on. That little thing is so hard to, especially at my, you know. So, a space liner, the sloop, and a yacht design for a Middle Eastern shake. Now, he didn't like lifeboats, thought they were ugly, so they were covered with these, these uh, hydraulic curtains which would rise up when you put the davits out to lower the, lower the lifeboats. Another craft designed for a guy in New Orleans, this was an SES ship. An SES is a surface effect ship and it has a big rubber sort of barrier hanging down in front and in back and you pump air into that and the ship essentially floats on a cushion of air. So you can go very, very fast in fairly high seas. This was 150 feet long. And then this. Now, Adnan Khashoggi, sort of the scallywag of the international dilettante market, he's an Israeli arms dealer. So he bought the hull that had been started by the uh, Shah of Iran before he was, had to leave the country under sort of embarrassing circumstances. And uh, so he bought the, the, uh, the, the hull. I get the drawings from Rome, and they have these big squares that go down about seven floors. Those are the gun turret emplacements. So anyway, I proceeded to design the exterior, which I thought would be like a small cruise ship rather than a sort of the swoopy lines of a, of a yacht. This was the interior of the Grand Salon, the dining room, and I thought, what a nice thing to have. This is a waterfall, but it's laminar flow, and these pins would come in and out randomly and create sort of a trail of water down there, and you could hear the water hitting down into the little pan below. This was done for Norwegian Caribbean lines. Um, they were going to build this, had a big scandal of uh, embezzlement in their Miami office. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so this was never done. But this was, the, was going to be a very sleek pocket liner. This is the last real ocean liner, the QE2. You can see how the deck stepped down and back. And this was designed for going across the Atlantic in style, New York, Southampton, back to New York, so forth. This is what they look like now. This is an apartment house on, uh, on steroids. Elegant. Isn't that elegant? <laughs> Let's go back to Robita. Uh, literally, as I said, you can't think about something you can't think about. You don't have the, the library, the, but you do what you can with what you've got. And this guy did some amazing, amazing stuff using the early uh, wax silk enclosed uh, gas bags. Uh, working on eventually to the uh, uh, Hindenburg. And back in the day, the flying boats 
were the most luxurious way to travel. Way in the back, you can see the private apartment, very way, way uh, far back from the engines, but they had din uh, dinner service, about 50 people maximum. This was another way to fly. This was the design for the interior of King Fahad 747, which I designed for a company that was building the interior in San Antonio. The 747, they just flew the last one, I think, last week, <clears throat> uh, is 20 feet wide inside. You can go up 13 feet, which essentially is an architectural space. So this was the modulus room, which is in, in, in Islamic uh, architecture, is like the throne room. No glass, everything has to be uh, plastic, clear plastic. And this was done for the Sultan of Brunei. There's going to be another 747. You can see the jacuzzi and the nose there for Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Sultan to do stuff. And uh, this post right here, right here, that's for if the pilot's instrumentation says we've got rough air coming up, what you do is you grab this, get out of there really fast because the water is sucked into a holding tank right under the nose gear. You, wanna, you don't want to have soft body parts caught in the drain. <laughs> this was the Grand Salon on board that proposed aircraft. The idea was <clears throat> that the Sultan would land the plane and then receive guests at the plane, in the plane, parked on the tarmac. So the idea was to make it look like it was not the inside of a plane. Tricky perspective problem, but uh, this was how it was going to be. Was going to look. This was what I mentioned earlier. Einstein was wrong. Tesla cooked up this transluminal equation. I've never tested it. I don't know if anybody has. How fast are we going to go? Is our spaceships going to be designed to resonate at a certain repeat frequency interaction with uh, the force field? Who knows? So right now, we have a book out called Century 2, available through at uh, better bookstores everywhere, actually available right behind the audience today. Isn't that convenient? Wow. So uh, we're going to wind this down, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. This is the uh, website. Thank you. <laughs>